really, I can't. Um, all right, so. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time, everybody. This is Dr. Rachel Poeta. She is a faculty in the online program. She and I were hired here at Alliant at the same time. Um, so she's one of the junior faculty here with me. Thank you so much for being willing to be here, Dr. Olafueta. We are very excited to hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I love supervision, and I actually really loved this class when I took it in my doctoral program. So I was thrilled when Dr. Lappin invited me to come and share a little bit about my own theory of supervision. Um, in all transparency, as I uh, was getting prepared for this uh, tonight, um, I was revisiting some of my notes and um, actually found myself sort of revising a little bit. Um, and that reminded me just how much our theories of supervision, just maybe like our theories of change can evolve and probably should evolve over time. So um, don't be afraid for your theory of supervision to also evolve. And uh, where, what you guys are doing in the class right now is just the beginning. And um, so without any further ado, let me see if I can share this screen here. A little bit of a modified share here. Okay. Very good. Sorry. I was, I'm trying to do a presenter view and it's just not really cooperating. So we are adjusting a little bit. Okay. So my theory of supervision. Um, like uh, Dr. Lappin mentioned, I'm Dr. Rachel Olufawate. Um, I have been doing supervision, um, whether as a supervisor candidate um, or fully uh, credentialed supervisor since 2016 when I began my candidacy work. Um, so I wanna first go over just kind of a summary of my supervision philosophy. It's kind of like the big picture, the broad strokes, and then um, go into a few more specific de details about what this can actually look like for me when I'm doing supervision. Uh, so from my perspective, both the supervisor and the supervisee bring expertise to the supervisory relationship. Um, each, both supervisor and the therapist bring various levels and kinds of expertise. Um, I see supervisees as the experts of their cases, and their therapeutic alliances with their clients. And the supervisor um, brings expertise regarding the process of supervision, technical knowledge related to advanced therapy, uh, as well as um, specific models of therapy and ethics and professional issues. So um, very collaborative in nature, seeing um, everyone in the room as having um, knowledge to bring to the table. And, um, I believe actually that supervisees bring a great deal of competence to their work and inherently want to provide quality services to their clients. So um, there's a lot of good intention behind what we do as therapists, I think. And I want to recognize that in the supervisory relationship and try and honor those intentions, even if they are getting stuck. Um, so to that point, I think every therapist gets stuck along the way. Um, we can probably all resonate with this as therapists. We've all gotten stuck. And so I think supervision should be a place where uh, supervisees can safely learn how to get unstuck while simultaneously learning how to become a more autonomous professional. So you'll hear a lot about kind of the establishment of safety in uh, my theory of supervision. And finally, I believe both therapy and supervision are at their most basic form, a helping relationship between people. So I consider the person of the therapist and person of the supervisee as important and one that plays an essential role in both the outcome of therapy and the outcome of supervision. So due to its importance, supervision will frequently, from um, my supervision, will frequently incorporate 
uh, self of the therapist focus. And specifically, I do a lot of EFT supervision um, because um, I think and clinically work primarily from an EFT stance, an emotionally focused stance. Um, so I wanna go over briefly a little bit about what EFT supervision can look like and um, kind of begin just orienting everyone to the research and um, where EFT supervision is kind of in the literature. Um, it's been used in a variety of ways and studied um, a little bit, not a ton of literature out there. Um, it's been um, looked at in terms of accessing therapists' primary emotion to um, really address the issues with therapists' family of origin as those are coming up in session. Um, that source, uh, Wetchler, 1998, uh, uses this one intervention from EFT, accessing primary emotion, um, to dive specifically into these family of origin issues. Not that that's the only thing you can do, um, but that's one way to use EFT um, as that kind of intersects with self of the therapist. Um, some literature has also uh, looked at developing a quantitative measure for assessing therapist fidelity to EFT. So if you maybe see yourself doing um, advanced supervision with therapists who are maybe trying to become certified in EFT, um, and maybe you've also pursued that route and you're an EFT supervisor, you might find yourself uh, using this measure um, to assess uh, therapists' progress and their, their fidelity to the model, um, their understanding of that. Um, we have recently, uh, I say recently, 2011, um, Lisa Palmer Olson's dissertation was on um, developing a model of EFT supervision, which um, was a primary source that I used in kind of wrapping my head around what does it look like to do uh, EFT-based supervision. And um, EFT has also been used in supervisory uh, modalities to treat compassion fatigue for therapists and kind of um, Soloski and Dietz used actually the structure of EFT, the steps and stages to try and help uh, therapists combat and come back from compassion fatigue. So it's been used in a few ways. Um, I think more can be done in this area, but it's a little bit of how it's grounded in the literature. Um, so a few broad strokes of pillars of EFT supervision, uh, some important things if you're going to operate from this stance. Uh, emphasizing the creation and maintenance of a strong alliance with your, um, with your therapist that you're supervising. Um, and that therapeutic alliance should have been adjusted, I think, to supervisory alliance. Um, we also heavily emphasize process and the use of emotional experience to uh, choreograph interactive change. So we recognize that the process of supervision and the process of therapy are isomorphic processes. Okay, so they're parallel processes. Um, and so we might take an issue that's happening in a case and through experiential um, sort of supervisory interventions, um, help the therapist get unstuck um, within that supervisory relationship. We also focus on identifying relational patterns when we're supervising a case uh, through an attachment lens. Um, and we might be specifically looking at not just helping the supervisee conceptualize their case if they are stuck there, but uh, really conceptualizing the relationship between therapist and client from an attachment lens and providing that kind of a feedback. Um, and generally the EFT supervisor is considered a strength detective. So we really want to ask the kinds of questions that are going to identify those strengths. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, point those out to the therapist. Because sometimes when we're stuck in a case, we don't see what we're doing well. And uh, we don't see uh, the strengths that we're bringing to the table uh, in the therapy room. And so when the supervisor can take on this strength detective sort of stance, then um, we can actually help the 
supervisor, excuse me, supervisee, identify what they're doing well and how they can keep doing that well. As you can probably hear, there is some integration in my theory of supervision um, that has some SFBT notes, uh, strengths-based, um, and also how I use that practically. It, it comes up in these sorts of ways and um, at a process level. It also comes up in kind of a structural level, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so what might this look like if, if um, you're adopting an EFT stance as a supervisor? What this looks like for me uh, when I'm working with a therapist, whether it's a student therapist or someone who's pursuing licensure, uh, and they do not practice from EFT. Uh, basically, the approach is to um, I adopt a way of being that's consistent with EFT and uh, then operate in supervision with the language of the therapist's model of choice to the best of my ability. And I might use selective interventions from EFT to facilitate change, again, in the stuck therapist client situation uh, to explore those self the therapist issues. Um, so this looks like establishing and maintaining a secure supervisory bond. Um, and I might you know, track the cycle between the therapist and the client, what's happening for you guys in session. Um, how are you being triggered with, with the client here? And um, I'll show you guys a little bit um, in a few minutes, uh, a sample cycle with questions related to uh, what's happening for the therapist. And it does look a little bit different when um, I'm also working with a therapist that's trying to practice EFT and use EFT with a case. Um, so we can get a little bit more um, in kind of the nitty gritty of uh, the model. Um, and four main goals of supervision in this kind of a setup where we're both coming from an EFT lens is um, of course still to co-create maintain that secure supervisory alliance. Um, but to then really ensure that the therapist is grounded firmly in attachment theory and in the model, this is where it might be useful to bring out um, the um, measure that I referred to earlier, the fidelity scale. Um, the third goal is to ensure that supervisees can deepen and regulate clients' emotions and to facilitate the bonding process. So a lot of uh, supervision could be focused on helping the therapist hone their skills in this area. And then finally, to ensure that they have the ability to regulate and use their own emotional processes in therapy. So some of the self the therapist type of supervisory sessions might uh, really center around uh, what's happening for them in the moment from uh, an attachment perspective. They can look at uh, their own attachment security we might even um, have reason to do a little bit of uh, attachment history gathering with the therapist if they haven't done that before uh, to try and identify, oh, this is kind of where my responses are coming from. This is why it's um, such a sticky area for me. Um, and all of those, all of that kind of falls under uh, these four goals here. So to get a little bit more specific into methods of EFT supervision, um, of course, it must begin with the bond between supervisor and therapist and that supervisory alliance. Um, and a lot of emphasis is on a securely attached um, alliance. This can be challenging if the relationship is new, the therapist and the supervisor have not had a lot of interaction before. It's very similar to meeting the client for the first time and the processes that we go through to develop that therapeutic alliance. Um, as with therapy, this maintenance of a secure uh, supervisory relationship is ongoing. And we recognize that there's going to be ruptures from time to time. And it's the supervisor's responsibility um, to try and repair that. Um, we believe from an EFT stance that safety really comes before therapist vulnerability. Um, so to establish that and to let the therapist know that I'm a safe person to be with, I'm a safe person to open up to and to really explore the moments that they're struggling with, you know, to be able to bring examples of their worst work 
rather than just their best work. And to know that it's a safe place to do that is really, really important. Um, we, as a supervisor, uh, really become that secure base for the supervisees when they're um, in places of insecurity, distress, or if they just generally need reassurance in the learning process. Um, I have to be approachable, respectful, and genuinely concerned for the supervisee's welfare. Um, people can tell whether it's our clients or our supervisees, we can tell if we're not being genuine here. Um, and again, just kind of how this shows up in uh, the development of the bond, this is where becoming that strength detective can be uh, really, really helpful. And that shows up in providing clear, specific, supportive, and corrective feedback that's directly related to their work. So being able to point to specific areas on videotape and give that feedback that's um, has a very direct link is uh, considered really helpful. <clears throat> uh, supervisors seed the supervisory environment also with discussions about therapist emotions and a willingness to share from our own lives. Uh, so there may be times where we use self of the supervisor to um, help create that alliance uh, with the supervisee and let them know this is a safe place to bring your vulnerabilities. And then we do some assessment. Um, and this gets um, a little bit more specific to um, exact cases. So uh, very similarly to how we might track the cycle uh, between a couple, um, I would be tracking the cycle that happens at a more meta level between the therapist and the client system. So this is one example here of um, a way that a cycle can form between uh, a therapist and client. Very often, um, just by nature of the, like the positions of power that we're in, it's easy for therapists to kind of shift into a pursuing role. Um, and then the withdrawing role, really, um, the client tends to take on that role. So we would go through all of these, these elements here. So um, this is, and I'll kind of go into this in the next slide in terms of assembling the therapist's emotion around the case. But um, as we're assessing um, kind of the primary areas to focus on, we want to know how is the therapist stuck? Um, how do the clients present? Um, what, you know, their history, as well as just how they're showing up in session. Um, we wanna know what the therapist has tried to get unstuck so that we are not pointing them in a direction that they've tried before and hasn't worked. Um, and we also wanna know, generally speaking, how the clients have responded to those attempts that the therapist has made. Um, all of these four questions can be really helpful places to start. Um, other assessment issues to cover uh, would include the therapist's clinical experience with couples in general. Uh, we wanna assess their areas of competencies and deficiencies in um, their practice of couples therapy um, and EFT, if they're trying to use EFT. Um, again, if they're trying to use EFT specifically, what is their understanding of the model um, in terms of attachment theory, the EFT tango, interventions, et cetera. Um, what is their acceptance of the model that they're trying to use with their couples? And um, how competent do they want to be in their work? Uh, what's their confidence level in practicing with couples? Um, and do you want to assess their comfort level with a variety of supervision methods like live, video, uh, role plays, uh, et cetera? We also need to assess their preferred learning styles to, so we can, as best we can, tailor the supervision process in a way that is gonna be most meaningful and have the, the greatest impact for them. And assess their own openness, the therapist's openness to discussing self the therapist issues. Okay, so what does assembling therapist emotion look like uh, when we're discussing a case? So first I would start with identifying uh, the cues that the therapist got from the client that triggered the therapist. What was, what was the look? What was the phrase? Uh, was it a certain posture, sort of like attitude? 
that a client had, um, what exactly was that? Now, if I've already done a bit of attachment history with therapist, um, it might be pretty easy to identify, okay, this is this is kind of rooted in your own family of origin stuff. This is why this is kind of a touchy area for you. Um, but we want to start there. What was the cue that started everything off? We then want to explore with a therapist what meaning they made uh, from that cue and around that cue. Um, and then explore the therapist's core emotional reactions in those moments. So uh, based on <clears throat> the meaning that they make. Uh, from that interaction with the client, from that moment, uh, what's happening for them? What comes up for them when they're telling themselves, oh, this client is just, they're so overbearing. Um, or that might be kind of a withdrawing type of response. Um, I'll share one from a personal experience. Um, I have gotten um, kind of queued up before with um, male clients who are on the fence, who have trouble really committing either way to being either all in or um, all out. And they just want to try and stay in limbo. And um, so the meaning that I've made in some of these situations when I'm feeling stuck is this guy cannot make up his mind. <laughs> he's, he's just being wishy-washy here. So you can tell it's not a very respectful way to be thinking about a client, uh, but we want to know what kind of meaning the therapist is making in these, these tough moments. Um, and then how they're feeling is really going to um, determine how they respond. So if, they've, if they then lose their emotional balance in that moment, if their kind of uh, emotional reactivity, their frustration, maybe their anger, maybe that just that stuckness, they don't know which way to go. Uh, kind of causes them to lose their balance, then we're going to see more of a more uh, reactive action tendency here. So the therapist might shut down. The therapist might change the subject from what the client is talking about. Um, they might move away from a client's emotional moment. Maybe it feels like the client's emotion is too big and it's too overwhelming. They don't know what to do with it. Um, and so they don't really, they don't really explore it. They kind of just keep it at arm's length. That's, those are all examples of kind of withdrawing types of action tendencies when we've lost our emotional balance. And um, on the other end, which is what I did with my couple, um, I lost my balance and I shifted into a pursuer role with my couple. And I started pressuring the, the client who was in limbo to decide, commit, you've got to make a choice. Um, and so I really stepped into the same, the same position, the same role that his partner was taking, um, which was also kind of a unhelpful pursuit. And then finally, um, exploring with the therapist, how, um, that whole process, the, the meaning making, the, uh, loss of emotional balance, um, their action tendency, how they responded, how did this impact the therapy process and the clients? Um, how do they see their clients respond in that moment after um, they've started pressuring or after they shut down the conversation or moved away from that? Um, and this can kind of help the therapist see how they can get stuck in a cycle with their clients. I mentioned earlier um, the specific intervention of accessing therapist's primary emotion. Um, so after you assemble this emotion a little bit, um, let's say after part of this, um, we do some accessing and really try to open up space. Um, once we've gotten that kind of reactive emotion, uh, we can circle back around and dive into that, ask them to take us back to that place where they were feeling really frustrated, where they were feeling like they, um, we're getting nowhere with the case. Maybe they're feeling like the case has stalled um, despite their best efforts. Uh, maybe they're feeling frustrated if they feel like the client is putting up lots of blocks or exiting a lot from the process and not really listening to what the therapist is trying to get them to do. Uh, we wanna dive deeper into that, 
for the therapist. Um, a direct way to do that is making just a straightforward hypothesis with them of the therapist's emotional response. Um, a more covert conjecture might also need to be used where um, we theorize about the client's experience to access the supervisee's primary emotion. So in this case, if we're having a hard time really getting the therapist to um, open up that emotional door, we can kind of go through the side window, which is the client's experience. Um, that tends to um, evoke some big emotion, just like it does in couples. So uh, very, very common. This is a challenge with a lot of withdrawers to get them you know, be able to access their emotion. So we can frequently use uh, the pursuer, if it's a pursue withdraw dynamic, to sort of evoke uh, a stronger reaction because they're more attuned and kind of reactive to each other. Uh, similar things can, can happen here in supervision. Again, it's an isomorphic process, which is how this can work. Um, really helpful if we have the opportunity to do live supervision, um, if we have the therapist take a break, we can do some reflections on um, what, what primary emotions the client might be experiencing during that break um, to kind of tap into what's happening for you right now, where are you feeling stuck, um, to hopefully help them get unstuck in the second half of that session. This is not just doable in life's revision though. Um, I think as we'll get in a few slides, um, we also do a lot of video. Um, I do a lot of video work um, so we can actually get our eyes on what's happening in the room. Additionally, um, I use a lot of modeling and practicing as a way to give um, therapists a chance to do something different um, and to kind of shake up stuck patterns. So um, this might look like uh, choreographing new patterns of interaction between the supervisee and clients. Um, this might be more possible, of course, if you have the opportunity to do live supervision. Um, but if you're reviewing recorded sessions, um, then the supervisee can practice uh, whatever kind of demonstrated uh, skill or role play. Um, if you're reviewing um, like master videos, things like that. Um, and even if you're reviewing actual work, um, a lot of this modeling can um, <coughs> kind of come out in the supervisory session where the supervisor kind of takes on this proxy voice like we might as the therapist with our client and do a little role play right there with, with the supervisee. Um, they can get a taste of what it's like uh, if they're not super comfortable with role play, which most of us aren't initially. They can get a taste of what it's like when they um, might ask their couples to do more experiential interventions in session um, to have maybe some increased compassion for how difficult that can be. Um, I wanna really emphasize on this slide, uh, the work that we can do with video supervision. I think it's, uh, it feels very rare these days that we get to do live supervision um, as beneficial as I think that is. Um, we can absolutely do kind of EFT tailored supervision through video. Um, and typically, it's best to um, really encourage therapists to bring examples of um, their worst moments, the moments where they're stuck, uh, the moments where they feel like um, everything fell apart because that's where a lot of the growth can happen. Now, occasionally, like if they've been, if they show a lot of these uh, clips where they're really struggling and then they have a breakthrough, they might really want to show you this breakthrough where things went well. And we absolutely want to make space for that and to celebrate that, um, kind of reinforce the gains that they just made and all the hard work that they put into kind of getting unstuck and conquering their challenge. Um, so it's not like I never encourage uh, good examples of therapy. Um, but the majority of the time will be would be spent on really looking at those stuck moments. Um, when we show a successful change event in, in our clip, 
um, reviewing that can, for the therapist, can actually stimulate recall, evoke emotion tied to that event, uh, very similar to um, when we're in that moment with our clients and we've just helped uh, two partners do something really hard, but it's new, but it's good. And we want them to just really savor that moment and to soak it in um, and to remember in their bodies how this moment feels so that they can recognize it when the opportunity comes up again. Um, this, a similar thing can happen with the therapist when they can review a really successful moment, they can kind of let that soak in. This is what it felt like to successfully facilitate this intervention. This is what it felt like to be so attuned to my couple that we just, it, everything just clicked. Um, it can help them make additional connections in their own therapeutic process with, with their clients. A few challenges, um, if you are supervising an EFT therapist, um, I think at any level, even if they're not trying to do EFT, but at any level, um, therapists, we often have difficulty staying with expanding and processing emotion. A lot of literature has been done and written at this point that supports how helpful it is to target emotion, but it's also really hard. Uh, at times, it's also really challenging um, for all of us, uh, regardless of how many years we've been doing it. There's just some cases that are so hard. Um, and so helping the client, excuse me, helping the therapist really stay in this spot, um, helping them stay with their own emotion, helping them expand their own emotion, helping them process their own emotion can increase their own uh, window of tolerance for depth of emotional experience, which they will need in order to tolerate their client's emotional experience as well and help their clients tolerate their own experience. Um, one additional challenge, like if you kind of see yourself as um, privileging the role of emotion and change might be if your, your supervisee is operating in a model that completely de-emphasizes the use of emotion and, and how do we work there? Um, so I would say I would, I would, you know, this is what I do direct back to, um, adopt the stance of EFT and you can still use some of that in processing the, the self of the therapist type work with the therapist, but then do your best to use the language of the model that the client or that the therapist is really trying to work in so to help them really conceptualize what they're trying to do. Um, from their own theoretical approach. Um, just for sort of a rhetorical question at this point, or we might have time to actually circle back around this and have some discussion. Um, what challenges can you imagine having with supervising an EFT oriented therapist? If you are not, if you don't kind of come from this orientation or vice versa, if you uh, really do privilege the role of emotion in change, what challenges might you personally have with supervising um, a non-EFT oriented therapist? Um, really quickly, if you're interested, um, the um, measure I referenced earlier is called the Emotionally Focused Therapy Therapist Fidelity Skill. It's a, quite a tongue twister, EFT, TFS for short. It's 13 items, it's pretty short, all on a five point Likert scale. And um, important though, that the rater must have expert knowledge of EFT. So this would be really useful if you see yourself kind of advancing in the model and maybe pursuing um, becoming like a certified supervisor in EFT and you're gonna be supervising um, aspiring therapists to, who are pursuing certification, um, this would be a good fit for you. Um, but it can be helpful. Why, why I listed it here, for, even for myself, is um, looking at these 13 skills. And um, we don't have to formally rate them, but we can kind of keep our eye on these areas um, just to kind of get a sense of um, these might be areas that the therapist is struggling with. 
uh, that we can focus on. So alliance making, validation, reframing, uh, managing couples interactions. How are they doing generally? Um, systemically working with two people in the room um, and managing their interactions there. Um, how, how are they doing with using enactments? How are they managing defensive responses? Um, how are they doing maintaining a focus on emotion, the cycle and attachment issues, things of that nature. So um, at least for the curious, I think this is, it's worth looking into. Um, a few other helpful evaluation measures, if this is kind of how your brain works, uh, there's the difficulties in emotion regulation scale and the working alliance inventory. Um, if your if your therapist that you're working with is thinking, I think this alliance is maybe struggling, but I'm not sure, this measure, the working alliance inventory, can be given to their clients to get their clients' perspective on how, how is the alliance working. Um, and it has a really high internal consistency. Um, so it's definitely a measure that I would trust. Um, and the difficulties in emotion regulation scale assesses the trainees perceived emotional regulation. So this could be used in more like self the therapist type work if you like to use um, assessment measures. So that went a lot quicker than I imagined. Um, thank you all for uh, listening to my little elevator speech there. Um, are there any comments or questions? Is, is there a slide anyone would like to go back and look at? Um, before I stop sharing my slides. Yeah. Um, you talked about <coughs> the, or how you'd address the therapist pursuer role, which sort of like, or the pursuer role that a therapist takes on uh, with clients. How would you address that specifically? Or maybe more Okay, I couldn't really hear the question. Uh, Dr. Bopping, could you um, yeah. rephrase the question? Of course. So the question was like the therapist tendency to take on the pursuer role with clients who may be emotionally withdrawing or just having that kind of be a general tendency and how you would address that in supervision specifically. Okay, yeah. Um, so I would address that head on, but not from like, an aggressive direct uh, way, but call it out. Like I notice this dynamic seems to be happening. What's what's going on for you in this moment as you're talking about um, how your, your client responded to you in this moment, or even if I've had the benefit of seeing that interaction show up on video, I might ask the supervisor, can we pause here and can we talk about what just happened? Because it seemed like a shift happened for you where it sounded like you started kind of pursuing a little bit. What was going on for you? So then it's, it's noticing the action tendency of the pursuit, but really using that as a doorway into um, helping the therapist describe, explore their own experience. Um, and they may or may not uh, have already recognized that that's what happened in that moment with the client. Uh, so if they haven't, then we could talk about, you know, what's, what's this like for you thinking about right now, um, you slipped into a pursuer role. Uh, some therapists may experience shame, actually, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I slipped up. Like I just you know, I did the exact same thing that the other partner was doing. It's not helpful. Like, how did I do that? So if that happens, we need to attend to that in supervision. Um, we can do a lot of um, reflecting and then validating the client, uh, the therapist experience. Like, this is really normal, um, especially if that therapist tends to take on the pursuer role in their own relationships, it's gonna be easier to slip into that. If a therapist is uh, typically the withdrawer in their own relationships, probably not as easy for them to um, pursue, um, but it might be really easy for them to withdraw as well. Um, my own EFT supervisor shared 
um, a story. I don't think she showed us the clip, um, but she shared a story of, and this was as we were actually kind of processing um, my video where I slipped into the pursuer role, she shared uh, a bit of an experience where she, she's a natural withdrawer, where she's like, I, I seriously curled up into the fetal position in the face of what my clients were doing in the room. Um, so that kind of normalizes it. So I would do that. I would normalize what's happening for the therapist. Um, that makes so much sense. Of course, this is a, you've been working with them for a really long time. Um, you're really trying to help them. You're help trying to help them get unstuck and things aren't moving very fast, right? Like it makes a lot of sense that you might shift into this pressuring role just to try and get them to make a decision about which way they want to go. Um, so that's where I would start and then get them to talk about, you know, what's, what's coming up for you that made um, maybe pressuring or, um, Therapists don't often get like super critical, but can even be like going up into their head and doing like more psychoeducation. Uh, let me teach you what you need to do. Um, helping the, the therapist slow down um, by asking what's happening for you in this moment. And then using silence, creating lots of space, um, doing a lot of validation, I think can open that door, create a lot of that safety. Uh, for how a quick, we don't have to worry about shame anymore because I'm hearing from my supervisor that this is normal, this happens. Oh, my supervisor even did it as well. Like, okay, I feel better now. <laughs> it's not just me. Um, so that's kind of how I would, I would respond to that. Um, another way to kind of directly address it is to start with, um, you know, I noticed, you know, something happened there. Um, are you, do you tend to take on a pursuing role in your own relationships, depending on what they say, and that could shift the direction of, of the conversation. Um, and so that can be a way to kind of introduce like, okay, let's, let's highlight a process that we just observed in the video and talk about what's going on for you. Um, and I think it's also helpful just to say things like, you know, that was a really difficult session you know, you were really um, courageous in showing that, that difficult piece of work. Um, you know, we wanna make space for you to kind of process what that was like for you in that moment, because those sessions are hard. You know, what's, what's kind of going on for you right now? Um, that's another way to kind of um, get into um, kind of the underlying motivations, emotional experiences, uh, meaning making that the therapist is using in those, those moments where they slipped into that isomorphic uh, pursuing role with their client. And that's a great question. Anyone else? Yeah, we've got one. In case you can't hear, I'm right here ready. Okay. okay. <laughs> First off, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It's beautiful, everything you've shown. Um, I wanted to ask, kind of going back to the strengths finding aspect that the ENT supervisor kind of carries. In your experience with the supervisees that you um, worked with, kind of this, what are the strengths or some of the characteristics that you've seen that kind of catch your eye and kind of have you thinking like, oh, this is a really good strength they have. They're going to clinically develop at a really good pace or just kind of how your process goes, like things that catch your eye with your supervisors. Yeah, thank you. I, I heard that one actually. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, actually, I'm going to stop sharing so maybe you guys can see my face a little bit. Um, so a few supervisee strengths that have, have really caught my eye. Um, tenderness, I think. Um, Supervisee's ability to kind of um, really catch those like painful moments that the client is bringing to the room, um, even if maybe and especially if the client just sort of like barely put it out there. Uh, when I see a therapist that like catches that moment and doesn't let it slip away and shows so much um, compassion, tenderness for that, I think that is such. Uh, a beautiful skill. 
and a beautiful strength that um, can often be overlooked because we can just sort of say, well, that's just what we're supposed to do as therapists, right? Like, that's just a common thing, right? Um, but if they're really good at it, um, then I want to make sure that they know that, that this is, this is an important thing that you bring to the table. Um, I also think it's an incredible skill when I see a therapist demonstrating a strong connection to their theoretical roots in the therapy, in the therapy room. Um, when their practice demonstrates how well grounded they are, um, I want to, I want to highlight that because that takes a lot of work to, um, hone their own theoretical understanding, knowledge, but then also figure out how to bridge that into the therapy room um, and stay close to their theory. Um, I wanna acknowledge that and bring that because that is a lot of work. Um, and that's something that I don't think comes naturally to everyone. So some folks have had to work um, extra hard at it, um, but that may be some folks um, really natural skill. And that's something that, that they bring um, to the table. Um, let me think of a few others. Uh, it's been a little while since I've gotten to supervise. So my memory is a little, um, a little fuzzy. I've also had a few kids since then. Um, let me think. In general, I think a few um, remarkable strengths are how well um, supervisees when they're with their clients, um, how well they're listening. Um, so when I hear them make really like attuned reflections with their clients, that's a skill I wanna highlight. Uh, that's a strength that I want to point out um, and compliment them on. Um, and in a very kind of solution focused complimenting way, um, how that is definitely uh, supporting their therapeutic process, right? And it's not just an intervention, it's also alliance building, it's alliance maintaining, um, helping them kind of connect a few dots um, of, of where that strength is kind of impacting the process. Um, yeah, and there's, depending on the model that they're using, if if they've just pulled off like a really uh, challenging intervention and it, and it went well, like I want to celebrate that big time because um, that's hard too. And I think uh, there can be some, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, insecurity sometimes uh, in showing that, like, especially if you're showing, if you're a, a trainee, and you're showing uh, a clip of like setting up an enactment to an EFT supervisor, you're thinking, I really hope this went well. I'm, I'm about to show this to someone who's such an expert, like what if I did it all wrong, but I'm thinking I did it well. Uh, there can be a lot of insecurity in that. And so if I recognize and I notice that they did a really beautiful job, I wanna say that. Um, one, because it reinforces their instincts that actually they did do it well. And uh, it reinforces their, um, their professional autonomy, I think, to do some self-supervision of their work to kind of gauge, okay, I think this was good work uh, versus, you know, I think we can easily identify the times when we did not do good work. Um, but they also need to hone their, their radar for identifying their good work. Um, so I think that's especially important to me when I recognize they are feeling really nervous about this intervention that they're showing. I want to make sure that if they did it really well, that I really build them up around that. So that's a few examples. Thank you so much. Yeah. not related to like the FT, but it's more in terms of supervision, if that's okay. Sure. So I'm just wondering, because I was, when I was doing my lit review, I was reading a lot of articles in regards to like grad programs and like therapists that do the training and that they're not meant for this career. So I'm wondering if in your supervision, you've ever come across a therapist in training that you're just like, 
uh, like you're having maybe like an iffy feeling about, or you're just having some doubts, um, you can speak to that. Yeah, great question. I was gonna, I have one ready for gatekeeping. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've had not too many while I was actually in the role as their supervisor. I've had a few of those encounters with like peers earlier in my graduate days. I'm thinking, yikes, um, is anybody talking to them about this? Um, and that kind of comes up for a variety of reasons, I suppose that like, ooh, feeling, um, but in the capacity of being their supervisor, um, I'll be transparent. I'm not sure I have like the most honed process for this yet. I think this is something because it doesn't happen all the time that you get a student, a student kind of crossing your path. That's maybe really not a good fit for the field. Um, I'm still kind of honing uh, my skills here, but I do think it's important um, to check in, especially if you're in a university setting and they're in their training program to check in with um, your program director to get some, um, like, okay, are there any policies that I should be aware of before having a conversation with the student um, to sort of counsel them? Uh, are there any university attitudes and positions on uh, what kind of conversation I have with a student that I don't think is well fit mm -hmm. for this field? Um, because politics actually do weigh in on this, um, but I don't like that, but it's, it's true. Um, and I think this is a type of thing where, one of the reasons I like initiating a conversation first with like my program director is so I don't have to make this decision alone because um, I'm having one perspective on the student um, and I wanna see, has, have other people also gotten the same sort of icky feeling or is it just like maybe something's off here in our supervisory relationship and maybe we're just not clicking very well. Um, so I wanna check that first before I have a conversation <laughs> with the student about, okay, let's talk about your direction in your career. Um, and here are your strengths. And I'm not sure that this field is really kind of in your strengths wheelhouse. Like that's a really hard conversation to have. Um, and I actually don't really like want to have that conversation, um, but it's necessary sometimes. Um, politically, again, if say you're a faculty supervisor in a university program, the, the department might decide that it's not your role to have that conversation with them. That might be like, okay, Thank you for referring this student to us and showing us your concerns. The program director or the clinical director, some, we don't have a clinical director per se um, across the whole program, but some programs do have kind of a one, who, one person who's in charge of all of the clinical training. Um, they might decide it's the clinical director's role to address this with the, with the student. Um, so, you might find yourself not ever having to have this conversation directly unless you are in the administrator's role. Um, and I do think that can be helpful for a number of reasons, especially if there's been some difficulties in the supervisory relationship. Um, the supervisee may actually take the conversation more seriously if it comes from someone else because it can feel less biased, right? Um, and chances are, if you're seeing something in supervision, in practicum, that's saying, I'm not sure that this person's a good fit for the field for X, Y, Z reasons, chances are other faculty have noticed similar concerns within the context of their academic coursework, um, as well as maybe even just um, like professionalism, interactions with other uh, administrators, staff, things like that. Um, so, Bringing it to the attention of the team, I think, is a really good way to handle this. And um, very similarly, I think it's, again, I, the isomorphic process here um, where we don't want to make big ethical decisions in the therapy room alone, right? 
I think when it comes to these kinds of situations, we shouldn't make these decisions alone either with how or when to counsel a student out of the field. Um, it's happened a few times. Um, I mean, I, it's happened a lot in, in our field's history. Um, at my doctoral institution, um, my uh, faculty member in this class, uh, supervision of MMT, said he had to counsel a few students out of the program, but it was in his role as the program director uh, that he had those, those conversations. Um, and yeah, those are really painful conversations to have, I think, all the way around. Um, the ideal situation is when the student knows that you're right and they say, yeah, I've really been having my doubts. <laughs> like, I thought this would be a good fit, but these courses, man, they're just really not jiving with me. Or I thought I'd like therapy, but then I started my practicum and I actually really hate seeing clients. Um, or, you know, they might even shift like, <laughs> Maybe that's the element, right? The, the applied doing therapy part that is not a good fit for them, but maybe they're really good researchers. And maybe what they're interested in is like human behavior research, right? There are uh, avenues they can take where they can do research where they don't have to be clinicians um, and they can still contribute meaningfully to the field and operate within their strengths. So um, I think that's important to keep in mind as well as it, uh, redirecting the student might not just be, you need to leave MFT altogether. Um, but maybe it's, uh, what are your strengths and how can we find um, the best, most attuned path to those strengths and uh, give you the support that you need to pursue that? Um, even if that's just like a slight different path within this field where you can still help people, you can still, um, do something meaningful, like, you know, applied research, for example. So yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah, what I'm kind of hearing you also, like, I just, it sparked an idea for me, Dr. Olafuete, of, of those who may not be in a university setting, when you are potentially seeing some of you, when you're having some of these concerns, to potentially do some assessment or asking some questions about any like sticking points that they may have had in their coursework. So if you don't have, you know, what Dr. Olafueta and I have the ability to do is kind of see a to see a student through like day one and then to the application of the um, material that they're learning, uh, that that might be something helpful if you are not in that academic setting. Yeah, and I think um, so say you're doing licensure supervision with someone, um, then it definitely is like on your shoulders to have that conversation with them because they're practicing under, really kind of under your license in a way, like you are, you are responsible for the work that they do. And um, so in a way, um, I guess one way that we have like official gatekeeping power is the documentation that we have to sign off on for them to advance uh, from associate level to you know unrestrict an unrestricted license? And so we might, if we really don't feel um, that we can conscientiously sign off on those hours, and we've had you know multiple conversations with them, we've tried to explore these areas that maybe they weren't as strong in. Um, that can be a way to do that, say, I'm sorry, I cannot sign off on your hours. I, I do not, uh, I cannot in clear conscience or however you want to phrase that. Um, I don't think this is a good move for you. And my job here is also to protect the public um, from harm. And I'm seriously concerned that you will do harm. Um, that's absolutely an important conversation to have. So I think, um, gosh, they might be really angry. <laughs> they might be really angry because they put in a lot of money and time in graduate school and all these hours. But uh, I think if you have concerns about it, don't wait until they've done all of their hours and they're about ready to submit their paperwork to not be an associate anymore. Um, 
because then they'll be really, really, really angry and they won't take it well. And they might file a complaint against you and all these sorts of things. Um, it's hard and it can feel scary if you're not like a confrontational person, uh, but to address the issues as early on as you can say, this is, if, if things don't shift and change, this is where I see this heading. I, I'm not sure that I will be able to sign off on your hours when the time comes, if these pieces don't change in, in your work. Um, I think to support that, uh, in my experience, it's far less common for supervisees who at the associate level to record their sessions and show tape of their work in, in supervision. So if you, you might have to like require that if you want kind of eyes on what's happening with your supervisees to get a sense, like a really confident sense that you can sign off on their work, um, you would have to include that very explicitly in your expectations, in your supervisory uh, contract, um, that this is a standard fundamental aspect of how you do supervision, that they need to be regularly taping and bringing in those sessions uh, for you to review. Um, and you can frame it as this is for your good and it's for the good of the clients that you serve. Um, my job is to help you be the best therapist you can be and make sure that you're providing you know, competent, safe, um, expert services. Um, and so that can be harder to suss out, I think at the associate level, if you don't have eyes on their work. Um, but there, there would be other cues potentially, like how do they interact with folks around the office? How are they um, to, to your knowledge, I suppose, um, how are they uh, interacting with people sort of like in public spaces? How do they treat the staff? How are they um, navigating the timeliness of their clinical documentation? Like, are they uh, showing responsibility in that area? Um, it might take a lot, I suppose, um, to say, I really think this is a bad idea, but uh, there could be some signs. And I think if you pick up on a few red flags, then that is also um, a good moment to say, hey, I think I need to start, I need to see some of your work, see how things are going. Uh, I want you to bring some tape in um, of pick your most challenging case uh, and pick your easiest case, the case that you think is going really, really well. And let's watch a clip from each of those and see, you know, see how it's going. Um, you don't have to go any further than that if you're kind of using that to see are any red flags also showing up in the therapy room. Um, and I think another way to do this outside the academic se setting is like if you own a practice and you're supervising therapists in your practice is to do regular like client satisfaction surveys where the therapist's name is attached to those surveys. And so if you start getting in complaints from clients about the therapist, um, you can follow up on like, what's the nature of this kind of complaint? Um, are you getting any uh, whiff of like inappropriate, you know, therapeutic relationships? Is that kind of what a client's maybe complaining about? Or, um, I mean, who knows? Um, but that's another way, if you can't always have eyes on their work at the associate level to kind of get a sense of, um, how do their clients think that they're doing? You know, um, clients are usually a little bit, um, their perspective of the therapist, their perspective of the alliance, their perspective of progress in therapy is more accurate typically than uh, the therapists. So getting client feedback, I think is important in helping us gatekeep in this area. Yeah. Some great questions. Well, I know I'm over my time. Yeah. Uh, so and it, it, she's in Eastern time too, so it's very late where she is. <laughs> Dr. Olafoweta, thank you so much for uh, joining us, for sharing, for allowing me to record you so I can share it with other students. Um, is it okay if I uh, provide students with your contact information if they have any follow-up? Yeah, of course. Great, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your night. Thanks, enjoy guys.